Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so you've heard of Brain in a Jar, and now let's talk about Brains in a Box. Um, so this is a talk about uh, essentially linking foundation models for the brain, which is what I'm uh, working on, to lo-fi whole brain emulation, which is something uh, that's very popular here. Um, so my goal is uh, actually to vastly accelerate neuroscience by building virtual brains uh, with AI. Um, so I work at Mila, uh, which is a, the AI institute that was started by Yashua Bengio, who's one of the fathers of deep learning. Uh, I've started out as a computational neuroscientist, and then I moved into the fields of, uh, of AI. I worked in industry for a while. I worked on brain-computer interfaces at Meta. Uh, I helped start the um, uh, nonprofit in uh, neuro and AI uh, education, which is called uh, Neuromatch. And so I've always been interested in that intersection of, uh, of these two fields and what can AI teach us about neuroscience and what can neuroscience teach us uh, about building intelligent systems. Um, so the thing I want to uh, <laughs> talk about is that neuroscience is, is quite slow. Uh, so oftentimes in neuroscience, we're really interested in mechanisms. That means uh, putting electrodes in, uh, in animals' brains. We have to train these animals. It takes a long time, and the failures are costly, which means that the experiments that we uh, tend to do are highly conservative. There are uh, you know, slight variations of experiments that have been done uh, in the past. Uh, and then that data is analyzed in a bespoke fashion by graduate students that, that really try to like, figure out what's going on inside the brain. And what that leads to is slow knowledge creation and really slow uh, publication cycles. Um, so I don't need to tell you, uh, I think that many of you are aware of Chris Ola's work on mechanistic interpretability, uh, and he has this nice blog post in which he talks about what are the advantages of doing virtual neuroscience rather than real neuroscience. And he says, well, you have a fully observable state, it's reproducible, you can do causal oblations, interventions, and edits. Um, there was actually a paper that just came out this, uh, this morning, a blog post, in which they're doing this for, uh, for large language models and doing ablations, making them more sycophantic, less sycophantic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's differentiable end to end, so then you can figure out what the optimizing stimuli are, uh, or you can design interventions, and so on and so forth. There's less animals involved in research, and it's much faster. Uh, so it sounds like just something that we should do as, as, uh, as neuroscientists. Now, uh, you know, methods that uh, we might be interested in using for that, uh, I think have been laid out pretty well in the uh, foundation model literature. Of course, we're all influenced at, uh, to some degree uh, by, uh, by ChatGPT. And these models, which are trained auto-regressively, have now been applied to robotics and also uh, to things like, uh, like video generation and image generation. Uh, so these puppies playing in the snow do not exist. Um, and, you know, the, the, the big questions, of, co uh, of course, is, you know, these models which are trained autoregressively, they use a, uh, a very large amount of data. So is there even enough data in the world uh, that it would be relevant to train large-scale models on, on found brain data? And my feeling is that, 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 that there might actually be close enough to the right uh, amounts of data. So there's about 90,000 hours of open data in uh, uh, in, in open archives that we know right now, and uh, it, there's probably about 10 times more in private archives, and we have pretty good ideas of on where that, that data lies. We just need to knock on some doors and take some names. Um, and if we were able to take all of that data in, let's say that there's a million hours of, uh, of neural data, uh, that would correspond to about a trillion tokens, which would put us in the right kind of range, provided that the scaling laws hold. Uh, for this uh, for the, for this kind of data, uh, compared to models which were you know state of the art mid 2023 when it comes to natural language processing, video, uh, or uh, speech to text. Okay, so maybe there's enough data in the world already. Like we might need also to to, to get uh, more data. Um, but you know, obviously, there's some real technical issues and how to take all of this data together. Somehow, you know, all of that data is not going to be taken from one from one animal, so it's not going to be an emulation of a single brain. It's going to be like some statistical average over a bunch of different brains. And then you're like, well, how do you take data from one brain and then compare it to the data from another brain? So we've started making some real progress in these in these questions. So let's say that we've got uh, three neurons in one monkey's brain and three neurons in another monkey's brain. So how do you relate these things? Um, and uh, so we can do uh, things like alignment and latent space. So essentially we uh, map each spike from uh, each neuron to different high dimensional embeddings, which performs a kind of latent alignment in, uh, in motor space. 
Uh, and you still get tons and tons of, uh, of tokens with that, so you have to cram them into a fixed dimensional latent space. But then after that, you're off to the races, and you can just keep having self-attention layers and do the kind of same kinds of uh, transformer architectures that people use in natural language processing and LLMs. Uh, they code the information out of that, and that works uh, pretty well. So we can take data from, uh, from uh, 11 monkeys, uh, distill that down. So this is data that was collected during brain computer interface, uh, during brain computer interface uh, paradigms, uh, and then apply that to uh, essentially transfer that model, fine tune it uh, for uh, for BCI applications. Uh, so this is a patient that was uh, paraplegic, and um, this is data that was uh, collected in uh, the late Krishna Shinoy's lab, uh, where the patient is imagining writing different characters. Uh, with, uh, with the Rhines, and so it's a different paradigm, it's a different species, it's a different um, uh, uh, electrode array, but it's pretty much, this, uh, it's, a, it's a similar kind of, of uh, latent space because it's still motor cortex, and lo and behold, that works much better than uh, doing it directly. Um, so I think that there's a lot of possibilities that, uh, that we could build if we could build uh, virtual neuroscience or just distill lots of uh, data in, uh, in brains. Um, so, uh, but there's still a lot of open questions when we're talking about foundation models for neuroscience. Some people talk about building models from uh, the input to the latent state of the brain, from the latent state of the brain to decoding, uh, autoregressive models of the state of the brain, or autoregressive models of measurements. And all of these things are slightly different. And uh, there's still a bunch of open questions, uh, but really this is the central quantity that people, th these are some of the central quantities that people have, uh, and I see that Anders is right here, uh, have said uh, that we should try and emulate to get a uh, whole brain emulation. I think it's a lot more tractable now than it ever was in the past. And so I have some open questions. Uh, and what I wanna do now is to work on a roadmap for lo-fi whole brain emulation. So please reach out uh, if you're interested in that. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, one thing I'm really curious about with this idea of doing like lo-fi approaches for neuroscience research is how do you intend to do the validation? Like especially if you're thinking about using existing data, this is often like lower resolution and maybe like not actually enough coverage to like strongly conclude you might have actually like approximated something that is like very similar to the reality. How do yeah. you think about benchmarking how close you are to the actual thing? When can you start actually calling it a virtual brain? And what does that mean for the confidence of your research results that you get from this type of approach? Uh, yeah, so there's many paradigms I think that uh, have been used successfully to figure out if you are capturing something about the neural population. There's co-smoothing in which you're essentially doing leave one neuron out. There's uh, prediction in the future, so essentially you autoregressively uh, you know, predict what's going to happen next by uh, conditioning on the past and then you determine what's going to happen in the future. Uh, those metrics are very easy to, uh, to, to write out. It's very similar to what you would do with large language models. But of course what you're interested in is a full simulation of an animal inside of an environment. And I think that there, the, um, uh, there's a proposal from uh, Tony Zader to do the embodied Turing test, which is basically if you want to prove to yourself that you've created like a whole brain emulation of, let's say, a beaver, you know, you would place the, uh, the virtual beaver inside of a virtual environment, and it would go to virtual trees and virtually annihilate them and virtually create dams and virtually flood the thing. Right, and uh, of course, the problem with uh, the embodied Turing test, as is it currently written, is that it's a one-bit, you know, measurement that a human looks at. You can't automate that, and still, kind of an open question: how you transform that into something that um, that you could backpropagate through, so you can do something like RLHF. Um, and uh, yeah, still, still a bit of an open question there. Yeah. Hi. Um, you mentioned that uh, you, you mentioned ways that you could um, um, use brain data from lots of different uh, animals, uh, but I assume that uh, the brain data will be collected using lots of different methods as well. You know, for mm -hmm. example, like you know, ECOG or fMRI and stuff like this. Uh, so, how do you um, how do you kind of make it so that your language model can use data from lots of different kind of you know brain data collecting methods as well? You start with spikes. 
So spikes, I, I think, are by far the most uh, the most important data in uh, in all of these data sets. And uh, the technical reason is that uh, is about the A matrix. Um, so there's always an observation matrix and whatever you know measurement system that that you have, whether it's local field potential. I think that. Uh, um, we heard about that uh, a little bit earlier, but essentially, uh, you know, different uh, measurement methods will sample from a different subsets of, of neurons and average uh, over them. And then the the, the problem is that uh, essentially that matrix of observations is very ill-conditioned, and so if you're, you're essentially implicitly trying to invert it, so what you want is to have as much spike data in which your measurement matrix is essentially the identity matrix partially the identity matrix and then you don't measure from a bunch of other stuff uh, to learn a good model from that and then you can fine-tune it if you have a good model of those dynamics at the single neuron level but definitely what you shouldn't do is start with EEG for instance and I try and try to infer what single you know neurons are doing because that'll never happen right. so. we'll leave it here. thank you so much